All right, hello everyone. This is going to be our last chapter in Unit 7 where we're going to specifically be looking at taxonomy and how we kind of um, classify species as a whole. So this is, again, a kind of a shorter chapter, but we're going to start off by just talking about what taxonomy is against, against the branch of biology that identifies names and organizes biodiversity um, through their characteristics. Now, I will say this um, kind of branch of biology is going through a bit of I kind of would say revolution, but kind of just a different way of looking at how we classify species. And this uh, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species that you saw probably in middle school first, and then your ninth and tenth grade biology classes in here again. I would say it's going out the door. It's not by any means, but we are kind of looking at how we classify species a little bit differently, um, just in a different way. And I, I know I've talked to some professors that are, are kind of looking at new ways of classifying these species because this is kind of, I would say outdated, but it's becoming outdated. Now, just a, a kind of a background, Carlos Linnaeus was the first a scientist to really, excuse me, start um, classifying species, and uh, we still use his system today. He wrote a book called Systema Naturale, uh, and this was just how we classified species for many, many years. Now we, we have evolved a little bit, um, pun intended there, uh, from this, but we still use his basic concept of binomial nomenclature. Now, interestingly, he didn't accept evolution, even though it was the 1700s before Darwin, he didn't accept um, that species change, but now we kind of like, you know, use his system of classifying things to classify uh, evolution. So it's kind of like all, uh, you know, LOL. You know, even though he didn't accept evolution, we still use his uh, system today. So you can see here, looking back at Linnaeus and then through the years, our ways of classifying species has definitely uh, changed, but it has gotten more specific and just more accurate as we have gone on. Uh, so binomial nomenclature, this is our two name naming system. So two name and then nomenclature is a naming system. And this is how we're going to classify organisms. And um, we use a, the language Latin um, because it's a dead language and the words won't change, the meanings won't change. Um, and we also italicize and under or underline um, both. So you can see genus and species. Genus is first, species is second. Genus is capitalized, species is not. And genus can sometimes be, be abbreviated. You should remember a lot of this from your ninth and tenth grade classes. You should see these um, binomial nomenclature names and be like, okay, I remember these. So it goes um, from most specific to least specific. It goes species, genus, family, order, fa uh, class, phylum, uh, kingdom domain. So domain is the least specific. So the most organisms will be in the, the domain. Only one organism will be in the species. And as we go up through here, they become more and more specific. As we go down, it becomes less specific. Um, so in this 19.2, the next section, we're going to be talking about the, the domains. And this, is, this um, classification system is, um, uh, again, the least broad or to say the most broad least specific uh and it was kind of um discovered and kind of you know uh i don't say differentiated by carl woes who uh discovered archaea which is a new type of kind of um organism just in general we're going to talk more about that in this section but uh this is where we're going to start looking at kind of the broader uh, aspects of of the classification system and then becoming more specific all right, so looking at this, we have our domains here, and the domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Um, each domain has specific characteristics that put the organisms in that um, area. You can see Luca we talked about in the last chapter. This is our last uh, universal common ancestor. From there, we have bacteria and eukarya evolving as well as archaea. Um, even though archaea is single-celled, it's actually more closely related to eukarya than bacteria. Um, and that's for a few reasons that we're going to kind of look at here. So again, you can see our last common ancestor, uh, of everything, bacteria evolve and eukarya kind of diverge along with archaea. Um, in the bacteria domain, you can see here they're single celled prokaryotic, which means they're microscopic. Um, cells contain peptidoglycan. Um, these can be beneficial or harmful or neutral to us. Um, it just depends on the type of bacteria and the organism. Archaea is single cell and prokaryotic. That means it's microscopic. Um, their cell walls don't contain uh, peptidoglycans. That's a big difference between the archaea and bacteria. So they don't have that peptidoglycan. And um, so again, looking back here, you think single cell prokaryote, that means bacteria. No, archaea are, um, they, they, they are not bacteria, they are archaea, and they're actually more closely related to us than they are bacteria. And they tend to live in extreme environments like um, soils, ponds, oceans, even deep sea uh, vents where it's really, really hot, they um, can thrive at. 
Oh, I like this fact here. No Archaea hurts humans. So very interesting. I, I learned that a couple of years ago. I thought I'd add that to my slides here. Archaea, this is the one we belong to. They're multicellular. Some are unicellular. They contain various membrane-bound organelles. That's like the mitochondria, the Golgi body, the you know vacuoles, things like that. Sexual reproduction is common in eukaryotes, but not all eukaryotes. Um, and they have the kingdoms of the fungi, protists, plants, and animals. Obviously, we belong to the animalia. You can see this um, this kind of chain of how things evolve. So protists evolve first, then plants, fungi, and then animals. So we're closely related to fungi. I say closely. We're more related to fungi than we are plants and protists. And we're going to be going over uh, looking at these things called collatograms next. Our next section is going to be on collatograms, and a common term that we have to know is common ancestor. This is a last organism that both uh, species are going to be related to. And I like showing this image for um, common ancestry. So you can see here, you and your siblings, your last common ancestor is obviously your parents. You and your cousins, your last common ancestor is your grandparents. You and your second cousins. Uh, your last common ancestor were your great grandparents. So you share a common ancestor with all of your relatives like you share a common ancestor with all life on earth. You just have to go back far enough. And we use these things called collatograms to show that the, uh, the um, common ancestors and how species descend from one another. So this is just a um, kind of like a map almost showing how uh, evolutionary history has occurred and showing something called derived and uh, derived traits and how they have evolved over time. Now this term is a little bit Kind of, kind of tough to, to describe. This is called a clade. Um, this is a common ancestor in all of its descendants. So you can see, you can see a clade here, a common ancestor in all of the descendants. A clade here, common ancestor in all of the descendants. This is not a clade because it's not a common ancestor in all of its descendants. You can see it has this branch here. You can see this is not a clade because it's a common ancestor, but not all of its descendants. So a clade is basically at one point from there on all of the descendants. We have two types of traits when we're talking about cladistics. We're talking about ancestral traits and derived traits. Ancestral traits are traits common because of a common ancestor. Derived traits are not common because of a common ancestor. You can see that ancestral trait here. All of these traits, all of these species have that trait. So think of this almost like a map and every single one of these organisms has this trait. However, not all of these organisms are going to have every single trait. So you, so you can see the trait here that A has. Um, no other organism is going to have this green trait. B, uh, or it's right here. Only B, C, and D is going to have, but not A. So again, derived traits are a little bit later on. Ancestral are, are further back in time. We also have things called phylogenetic trees, and honestly, they look very similar to cladograms, and they basically are a cladogram, but um, they look at more specifically uh, time. So the difference is they add in time, and they show um, evolutionary history based on a time uh, kind of period. So you can see here, cladograms are just more just like, hey, these are how they related. Phylogenetic uh, trees show you, hey, this is the time period when they uh, diverged. So we can see in this case um, how many millions of years ago each one of these species derived from each other. Uh, with the collatograms, we also have uh, some terminology we have to know. The nodes are the speciation event, which we've talked about before. Um, so you can see this is a speciation event between humans and mice. And the root is the common ancestor. So you can see the root here um, is the species that led into the divergence between um, these two species. We also have things called outgroups and uh, ingroups. The outgroup is a species that does not fit a specific clade, and we use this to kind of define what a clade is. Um, this helps us kind of speciate and say, hey, this is a part of the clade, this is not a part of the clade. One more thing with clades and cladistics, you can rotate these kind of arms or, or the, uh, the roots here, um, so it does look kind of confusing, but these two trees are basically the same thing. Um, you'll get some practice with doing these clades and moving these trees around. So just understand that these can get complicated. All right, we're going to stop there for a little bit. All right, our last section here is going to be on how we actually make these um, phylogenetic trees and collatograms. Um, basically, physical characteristics can be kind of mis misleading. Um, all of these organisms look very similar, but they um, you can see they all obviously are in, you know involved in with water uh, or live in the water, but they involve with water transportation and how they move through the water. Um, but all of them evolve these kind of characteristics a little bit differently. Um, and fossils don't always, you know, point us in that perfect direction, um, but we call these uh, things the convergent evolution, where they all converge in the same kind of adaptation, but maybe they evolve from separate uh, kind of 
mechanisms they use to uh, evolve that. So you can see fish evolve uh, with the sharks, land, e land reptiles then evolved into the ichthyosaurs, and land mammals evolved porpoises. So they all push through the water, but they do it in much different ways. So not only all the time do we see these really, you know, sharing the right common can characteristics that we might see on a um, cladogram. What's better to use is uh, molecular DNA because um, mo or molecular DNA uh, we can do we can use numbers with. And what we're doing what we show is the more closely two organisms are related, the higher chance they have of having a common recent ancestor. So we can use these numbers, which we again we like numbers in science a lot more than just comparing like observations um, to make these cladograms and phylogenetic trees. We can all this do we can also do this. Let me go back with protein comparison. So so comparing the number of differences in amino acids of a protein. That can help us chart these out, as well as looking at molecular clocks. These are just mutation rates that we see, uh, or the changes in the mutations of these different species. So we can use either molecular DNA, or we can use protein DNA, or protein comparisons to map out these cladograms, which makes it a lot more accurate than just showing and kind of comparing physical features. Oh, by the way, this is the end of chapter 19.